Sorry. Right. All right. Share screen. Okay, there we go. All right. Digital folks, I will keep the square the screen shared all day um, so that you know we can all see each other um, better. But for just a few moments, I'm going to. Okay, cool. All right. So um, our agenda for today. First of all, I want to encourage you later, not right but later, if you could go in and check on your art, summative reflection, something you did, I believe, about 10 days ago. I finally got a chance to read everybody's and give you some comments. And um, don't feel like you actually need to type a response if I left a question for you there, right? You're more than welcome, You're more than welcome to type a response. I don't get notified if you do. So if you type a response and you want me to respond to your response, you'll have to let me know. And then I can go in and respond to your response. All right. Um, just a couple bits of advice, though, on the summatives. First of all, a lot of the summative refle reflection comments were awesome. You guys gave me a lot to think about. I can tell that you were thinking and engaged in the unit. All right, which is awesome. However, however, some things to think about in terms of improvement for the future with TOK assessments and reflections and things like that. First of all, I had not one, not two, not three, but probably six or seven students who said something like the following. I know art is good when it's cool. Period. Ooh, moved on. Or art is good when it's interesting. Period. Move on. All right. That's cool. Art is good for you when it's cool. What makes it cool? How do you know when art is cool or interesting? Ooh, now we're getting to an interesting question. Because now you have to actually stop and think, okay, I think this particular artist is cool. Why? Can you articulate that? One of my favorite songwriters is Paul Simon. Old school guy. Why, Mr. Hodgson? I think he's interesting. Okay, Mr. Hodgson, why do you think he's interesting? Oh, now we've got a question. I think he's interesting because, at least for the last 30 years or so of his career, he's been inspired by world music, especially the music out of Latin America and Africa. I find the use of interesting rhythms and melody structures to be unique and novel. I find his melodies to be earworms. They, they're hummable. They get in my, right? So I'm now beginning to sort of articulate and explain what it means for Paul Simon to be cool or interesting. I could do the same with the Coen Brothers movies. I love the Coen Brothers movies. Why, Mr. Hodson? Well, I could talk to you about dialogue, script writing, the way scenes are crafted, camera shots, right? So in your reflections, go for depth, description, clarity, rather than feeling like you need to cover all the prompts. Another thing that a lot of your reflections said, this, this goes for you guys online too, a lot of your reflections said, art is, I know art is good when it makes me feel an emotion. Okay, uh, that's, that's awesome. Are you ever not feeling an emotion? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's an open question. We could do a unit on emotions and talk about it, but I'm not sure that you are. So, I mean, if boredom's an emotion, right? And oh, by the way, you didn't tell me what kind of emotions you, you meant, right? If, if a piece of art disgusts you, that's an emotion. Does that mean you love it? I mean, it could. I don't know. You just said it makes me feel emotions. So again, to the extent that you can, all right, when you use words like it makes me feel emotions, or I know it's good when it's cool, or it's interesting, what do you mean by that, right? What do you mean by that? So again, this was our first like sort of real big reflection assignment. I didn't take any points off, right? Because first of all, who am I to say that your reflection is good or bad, right? I mean, it's your, it's your reflection. But what I am saying is in the future, what I'd really love is for you to worry about less breadth. Don't feel like you got to cover all five or six of the bullet points and just go for the depth. Go for the depth, all right? 
Okay, I'll pause for a second. I'll, let me share my screen here so that I can see all the folks. Oops, not a new share. Stop share. Okay, you are so patient with me, I love you. Okay, I'm scanning the online crowd, looking for any hands that are up. Anybody got questions or comments about that? that feedback, feedback. All right, folks that are in the room. Oh, Dylan, I love it. There's a hand up. Um, this isn't necessarily about the somewhat of reflection feedback, but it was about the next um, topic on the agenda about the reading we had on Tuesday or yeah, Tuesday. Yeah. Um, our group, my group didn't get through all of it in the time. So I didn't turn it in because I thought we we're going to have more time to discuss it. Do you, do you just want us to like go through by ourselves and write more notes and then turn it in or what? No, you're all good, man. First of all, you're not turning anything in with that assignment. So you don't need to worry about that. And I meant what I said last class, which is that it's okay if your team spent extra time on one question and you didn't get all, that's totally cool. We're going to talk about it all together today as a group and um, you'll be able to sort of catch up. Does that, that make, make sense? Yeah, thank you. Je vous en prie. Okay, I just dropped a little French on y'all. All right, cool. Any other questions on the online crew? I'm scanning around. Look at this. Look at me scanning. You can't scan like this, bro. This is amazing scanning. Okay. All right. Everybody's Mr. Hudson. Oh yes. Is that John? Uh, if if you're trying if you're trying to speak to us uh, at the computer, for some reason I don't know why, but I can hear you better when you're in the, like the front of the classroom than when you're right next to the computer. There's a microphone. I think All it's because right. the mic is behind him. He yeah, like, when you're right next to the computer, I can't even hear you. Okay, I'll make sure I turn around and run at the computer backwards. <laughs> that, 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 that couldn't lead to any problems at all. That, that, that's got to be the best idea I've had all day. All right, cool. Okay, let's practice. All right, can you still hear me, guys? All right, can you hear me all right? Okay, okay, all right. Okay, sweet. So, all right, I'm going to share my screen again real quick. So we can talk a little bit. Oh, so we can talk. A little bit about the reading. Okay, there we go. All right. So we can talk a little bit about the reading from last week. All right. Okay. Oh, now this isn't going to work, really? Oh, that's right, because I have to do this first. Okay, there we go. So I have to work. All right. All right. Let's talk about the reading a little bit. The first couple of prompts asked you to think about this idea of moral virtue versus technical knowledge and skill. Confucius really thought it was important for the political leader to be moral and virtuous and for the relationship between the rule, the ruler and the ruled to be that of sort of like a family where sort of like this idea of loyalty and moral virtue is super important. Another perspective on this would be that moral virtue and loyalty are nearly as important as like specific technical knowledge and skill. I don't really care about my political leader's personal life. I don't really care what he or she does in her free time. What really matters to me is that they're really good at doing what I've elected them to do, like running a healthcare system, defending the country, or passing legislation effectively or defending the rights of the mind, whatever, right? So where do you guys sit on this balance between moral virtue, technical skill and authority? Of course, in a perfect world, we'd have both, right? We want both. We want the most skilled and technically able person to also be the most morally virtuous and vice versa. But let's imagine for, for, for a moment that we had two candidates for office, one of which whose morality and virtue was beyond reproach, but they maybe weren't the sharpest tool in the shed. Okay, the other one, wicked smart, whatever area they're being elected, dog catcher, right? Supreme Court justice, whatever, whatever we're, or, or, I guess we don't elect a Supreme Court justice, but whatever we're electing this person for, they're super smart, but, we have some questions about their morality. Where, I'm gonna go back, turn off the screen share. I wanna, I wanna know what you guys think. Where do you fall on this? Online folks. Yes, Christian, jump in, brother. 
Um, this is de definitely a v very difficult question to answer, but I think if they've had moral issues in the past, if they can recognize that and not apologize, but I mean, they could apologize, that'd be nice, but say, hey, I was wrong. Here's, I mean, I don't know. I feel like they need to be more of a person than a politician. They need to not isolate um I don't know. They, they, it goes hand in hand. It's a. It's. I'm. I'm on the side of the good guy, not the good moral person. That makes okay. Sense. So for you, you fall onto the side of virtue. If you had to choose, you'd go with the more more virtuous. John, I love you. I'm going to come to the live folks, the in person folks. John, what do you got? Uh, I would. I would actually go with the guy who knew how to do his job like overly well, because, yeah, you might. Uh, might have the one guy who's virtuous, but if he doesn't know how to even run like whatever he's going to be doing, then how can you even trust him to be in that position? So, and another thing uh, why I would choose the uh, technical person is that virtue can change over time, whether that's through the uh, like people uh, that the person's representing or the person themselves through being in that position. Okay, so what I hear you saying is that virtues change over time. Doesn't also technical skill ch change over time? I mean, what it meant to be great at running a healthcare system in 1980 is definitely different than what it means to be great at running a healthcare system in 2020. But, but, uh, but, it just, but more, like, uh, more than, uh, most of the time it usually just gets harder. So if it's just gonna get harder over time then having someone with already a good level of skill can mean uh, that they won't fall behind as fast. Okay, okay. All right, so you're sticking with your technical skill. Um, I wanna come to the in-person folks. Let's go Sophie and Ritesh and Elias, and then we'll go back to our online folks. Sophie, what do you got? I think personally, I would go with the virtuous person, even though I understand there is an importance to being good at your job. There's like a saying that is like, you're too smart for this. Like I used to be told, like you're too intelligent to play a dumb sport. Like, like you can overthink things, and also sometimes people who are so technically focused lack people skills. And so much of politics is more than the legislation, because you have a cabinet, like you have people who help you. And honestly, the president isn't necessarily going to make a decision without talking to his cabinet chief of staff, like the legislative committee. Like he's going to be talking to people. So for me personally, it's easier to be with someone who's like, you know, they're going to get along with these leaders and our allies and they're going to be able to create relationships instead of someone who's so focused on their job that they might not be able to think outside of the box or make new relations with people because they're so focused on this set, like idea and skill set they believe they have. I want to I unpack some of the things you said, but first, online folks, Beatrice, Emma, could you guys hear Sophia all right? A little bit, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pump up the volume a little bit. Okay, that should help a little bit. All right, so, Sophia. Okay, she's acknowledging, right, that actually the way real government works is that you have what are called the, the bureaucrats and the technocrats that are actually like the ones doing the work, right? And these other politicians, the face of the government, the ones we elect, Right there might be the ones that we want to be morally virtuous and then trust that they'll hire minions that will actually do the dirty work correctly. Does that, does that summarize? Yeah, if it, like also um, I get told by my father who was a C student, is C students run the world and then A students work for C students. So it's the same idea of you don't necessarily need to be the most intelligent to get the best job, someone that's just who you hire. Okay, online folks, a shocking claim was made. Did you hear that claim? <laughs> okay, all right. So, so uh, Mr. Uh, Zanders, who, who, by the way, I still need to go out for chicken wings with. Okay, we haven't gone out for chicken wings yet. I'm still waiting on that. But he says C students run the world. Okay, all right, we'll have to check the veracity of that claim. We still are waiting on Donald Trump's report card and transcripts. Okay, and we got to get Obamas, and we got to get Bidens, and we'll see if, in fact, see oh, students around the world. Okay, Ritesh, what were your thoughts? Um, I want to go back to John's point about, I kind of forgot how exactly what it is, but something I'll have, like, 
Along the lines of yeah, how um, what do we say? Morality changes over time. <laughs> Morality changes over time. So I was gonna say I feel like technical skills would be like a thing that would change more often than morality because morality is something that is like drilled into you when you're when you're like small and little and then you people tend well I'm not like kind of all people but most people tend to have that morality when they grow up like throughout their whole life well technical skills they can as society and um, the times are changing people learn so like when John said that um, it's harder for people to learn new technical skills I would agree with, disagree with that so I just want to get back to that point yeah okay so you you feel like Morality doesn't change as much as, as technical skill changes. Let me ask you this though, Ritesh. Is moral virtue universal? No. Okay, so if I say I want a politician that is, has strong moral character, that I, I like the moral and virtuous nature of this, of this candidate, and you ask, okay, what are you looking for? And I, I list the five or the 10 morals or virtues that are super important to me which leads me to say support Donald Trump because he has the morals and virtues that I find to be the ones I want magnified. And you're like, bro, he's one of the most amoral and virtuous people or vice versa. I say, no, I want these morals and virtues and, and that's why I'm voting for Biden. And you're a huge Trump supporter. And you say, those are the worst morals and virtues ever. How do we reconcile that, Ritesh? Well well, like another point that I wanted to bring up before talking about this is that um, more like I believe morals should play a part and like a secondary part in choosing our politicians and leaders. Obviously, whoever has more technical skill should be the one selected for. But if you're talking about two people with similar abilities, then you would go to morals. Okay, so, okay. So morals is like is like the second column of the rubric. Kinda, I don't know. It's really hard, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ritesh, that is the that is like the subtitle of this course. It's really hard. I don't know, dude. Okay, Elias, what did you want to say? Um, yeah. So like, obviously, the obvious question, if we had the chance to say, it would be, you know, a balance, just find a balance. But like Mr. Hudson said, um, said, it's not an ideal world. Which I think, um, you know, when you look at a leader, um. You're not only seeing that person's the person that's in the position, but you also gotta see the person that's like um, as a person, as an individual, right? And I think like sometimes, even though it might be possible, it's really hard to separate them both. It's like it's like if I, I were to say my school self is gonna be totally a different person from my social self. Mm. Very hard because I have people around me. I think that kind of happens with like if you have a position, it's kind of hard to like. You know, kind of change your whole person around like that. Because of that, I think I will choose and going back to our touches point because I think I'm a man. I will go with the moral person if it was in the right morality. And because you know, it's kind of like when you plant uh, a plant, you take the seed, put it in there, and you make one, and that becomes your foundation. Mm -hmm. Your morality is often your foundation. Nobody's going to convince you, like, hey, um, this is a fact. Oh yeah, I just changed my morality. Do it. I'm a Trump. Like, doesn't really happen because it's in you. It's part of you. But technical skills, that's what school's for. I can learn it right now. I can understand the fact. But morality is not as easy to change. Interesting. So you kind of are who you are morally or, or your virtues. That remains relatively unchanged. But technical skill, that comes and goes. Yeah, you can improve it. Like maybe you have a good morality, and if you don't have good technical skills, you can improve it later. And then if it's vice versa, it's harder to improve morality. You know, what is one of the biggest problems that politicians run into? They run into problems of hypocrisy, right? Where they preach, right, through legislation or through their own political stances that X is wrong, Y is wrong, Z is wrong. And then what happens? The picture gets leaked, right? The text message is unearthed, right? And then what we have, we have the big, the fall from grace, where a politician has said, adultery, I'm a huge Christian, and adultery is wrong. Whoops. Except for me and my secretary, right? Or, or whatever, right? So that's, that's, oh, okay, interesting stuff, interesting stuff, okay.
We're going to move on to a new topic, but I want to give the online folks a second. Anybody else have anything to say on this? Yeah, Christian. I don't know. I was just thinking like a good example of this in terms not of politics is like a teacher. You know, your first year is always kind of rough and you're still figuring some things out. And like I've heard this saying, like nobody knows what they're doing in their job. You just kind of figure it out and work together. And I think in terms of morality for me, you know, it's those soft skills that are oh, I'm thinking of PSAT, but uh, like those are really marketable um, and uh that, that's what people want nowadays. I'm going to stop talking, but you know what I mean. It's like, it's, I was using the teaching example as something that Elias was saying about how it's hard to learn morality, but it's easy to learn those skills that you use in that profession. Can I tell you a true story class that relates to this? And I mentioned, I kind of talked with some of the breakout rooms about this. So, so some of you uh, uh, that are online digitally right now, this may strike a familiar chord. True story. My senior year in high school, I had a favorite teacher. He was amazing. He was a first or second year teacher. He was full of energy. He was, you know, he was like the, the coolest high school teacher. He was great looking. He always wore awesome clothes. Like everyone loved, loved this guy. And he, he helped sponsor a club that me and my friends started. And we were super close to him. And uh, he was, you know, he was always there. And then just as we were about getting ready to graduate, he got pulled over and arrested for a DUI. Okay, true story. Driving while under the influence. Drunk driving. Okay. True story. I wrote him a letter explaining how disappointed I was in him, how he'd let the school and the community and his students down. Was, was I right to do that? Um, I don't know. Maybe. Yes. I mean, who knows? When I was 18, I thought it was an important thing for me to do. Right. I had a, I had a clear identity of what I thought was right and wrong. This person that I had admired and respected that I had looked up to as per moral and virtual virtue leadership had, had let me down and I felt the need to let him know about it. True story. True story. Yeah. John. Foster. I have I I just want to like uh, ask like a question to the general class, but I feel like and it's kind of related to what you just said. Uh, and but what is everyone thinking as a general baseline of technical skill? Because I feel like there's a lot of like because Christian had said uh, that it's easy to acquire technical skill, but it depends on how much technical skill you're going to acquire because. We spend at least like 12 years in like uh, going all the way to high school uh, and you just get a high school diploma. And that's just if you're going to get a high school diploma. Now, if you're going to go for like to get a doctorate, then that's so much more, uh, that's a lot more time off of your life just for school education. So what are we all thinking is a baseline of technical skill? Gary, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with John because the, the whole thing of technical skill is that a lot of what you consider to be morality or like um, just general how they see the world or whatever could be kind of seen as technical skill if we're talking about politics. If you're a politician, what's stopping you from not telling the exact truth about what you believe to achieve your goals through alternate means? There's nothing stopping you so long as people don't know about your actual moral views. Just like um, Abraham Lincoln was not intending to rid the United States of slavery. He thought it would just go away. He had to like take action on it. It was not necessarily what he morally believed, but he thought that that was what was necessary for the country, whether or not he thought that that was what was right to do at the time. So we have here an instance in which someone wasn't being honest about their personal morality. This is the argument you're making, but they were making the correct political decision that needed to be made in order to save the country. So this would be an example in which technical skill is, is more important than virtue and morality or that someone can be technically skilled in politics by not showing their virtue and morality. 
kind of photo. Yeah. Okay. Interesting point. Interesting point, Garen. Sophie, final word on this one. Um, I think going back to what John said, honestly, I don't think there's any technical skill required to be a politician. I don't think that's what, and I think it's sad. Like, I think there's also an issue we have in politics where people are in politics their entire life and it is their career. And then they take bribes and they make so much money out of office, which isn't right. But like, if you look at like, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, like she had no technical skills, but everyone liked her morals and virtues as a person. And that's what led her to be elected. And like, if we're looking at this new age of like, people being elected to Congress or like the House of Representatives, it's starting to move away from people who are career politicians and lawyers and the people who just have strong values that people can relate with. So I think as our country kind of like evolves and changes, we're almost going back like when it used to be that people who were in politics had another job, it's to people who don't necessarily have a technical skill specifically for politics, and instead there's a higher focus on morality. You are, uh, that's interesting. It's an interesting hypothesis. And of course, only the future will tell us if it's true. Like AOC may stay in office for the next 80 years, right? And become a career politician herself. But, but, but later on today, or perhaps when we meet next, we're going to be talking about your generation's views on the changes that are happening in politics and how there are some serious implications for that. All right, I wanna ask about this next one. You were also asked in those readings last class to think about this idea of individual liberty versus some measure of shared equality. So we have Adam Smith, who basically says like, laissez-faire, like let the individual do what the individual can. Um, they will, everybody, act, you know, sort of an enlightened self-interest. If everyone's acting in their own self-interest, it'll be best for everyone. Let the markets be open and free. You have Karl Marx who says no, right? There's a place for the state to, to like step in and, and guarantee or attempt to make sure that there is some sort of shared equality among the citizenry. Where do you guys fall on this notion of individual liberty versus shared equality? Of course, in a utopia, we'd have both, right? We'd have everyone completely free and also everyone completely equal, right? That would be amazing. Like everybody's free and everybody has a Bugatti, right? Um, but short of that, short of that, where do you guys place the emphasis? Okay, again, I'll stop the share here so we can see our online folks and our artificial folks. All right, online folks. Claire, get us started. We haven't heard from Claire yet. I think um, when people are set at like a disadvantage, they're never going to have the same level of freedom as other people. So the idea of individual liberty is like, not going to work for everybody like through some people's individual liberty they might um like impose upon other people and other people might not have the opportunity to exercise liberty which um some people say would exist in like a completely um free market like that so i think the idea of imposing at least some form of shared equality is very important um because it protects people who otherwise would be vulnerable and there's would not be liberated at all. How do you feel about where your political um, context is balanced on that currently? Do you feel like there's enough of an emphasis on shared equality or too much of an emphasis on individual liberty? How, or do you not feel comfortable voicing your opinion? I definitely do not think there is enough em emphasis on sh shared equality. Um, like a big issue, especially with um, like medicine, uh, people's people not having um, equal access to medicine because of its high cost. Like, I think that's an example where there could be more equality among people because, like, how can you say somebody's free if they're going to die because they're more poor than another person? So. Thank you, Claire. Um, other, other people, I'm going to look online to see if we have any other folks that haven't had a chance to speak today. All right, let's go back in the room then. Let's go back in the room. Anybody here in person, do you feel comfortable talking about where you fall in this balance? Um, Elias. Um, yeah, so I think in order to talk about it, I think, um, you know, sometimes we get confused with equality and equity mm -hmm. a lot. And like there's a reference, like let's say, you know, Mr. Mr. Hudson's, I think he's taller than me, maybe. But if let's say 
Mr. Hudson and I were given like the same, um, let's say like a chair, right? And the chair's the same height. That's equality, right? We, we have the same fraternities, the same resources, and the same help. Now, equity is because I'm smaller, I'm giving Mr. Hudson a taller chair, which makes us like an, an equity kind of thing, like mm -hmm. same, same height, you know? So I think with that is that, you know, I just think like um, shared equality, in a sense, like if you give the same returns to someone, I think I'll go with that because you're kind of at the same time giving kind of a sense of freedom, right? Because that opportunity comes with a, a right or something that, you know, the person feels that has opportunity to do it like another person, you know? Uh, so you're, you're sort of rejecting the dichotomy in a way and saying that, in fact, shared uh, equality would in itself be a, a freedom, a freedom to feel equal to your peers. Yeah, I think kind of. Is that kind of what yeah, you're thinking? Somewhere. Okay, okay. I'm going back to my folks online. I want to scan the audience real quick before I, before I move on here. Okay, yeah, John, John, go for it. I agree that there should be some uh, sort of baseline uh, for like, an equal society because uh, if you don't have anything to support people, then yeah, a society like uh, uh, lesser fortunate individuals will be uh, like uh, will have less fortune, like obviously. But I, I think that in this case, the individual liberty is more important because uh, beyond the baseline, if you want, I think if you want to live in luxury then I think it's up to you and your own personal ambitions to formulate your own uh, game plan in life to acquire that stuff. Because if you ha say uh, the homeless man on the street, you know, like the beggars on like corners and stuff that just ask for like pennies and things. Uh, there are different examples where you have pictures of homeless people begging and then homeless people begging for jobs which one do you think will end up living a better life? The homeless man begging for the job because uh, they're, because like when, if they get a job, they're gonna earn much more money and they're gonna be able to live a much better life. So while I think that it's good to have a baseline so people can still live uh, with all the things that they need, if they wanna have what they want, then that's, what, that's where I think uh, it comes down to ambition and your own personal pride and what you think you need to do to get that. Okay, I mean, that's a very reasonable, you know, I mean, that echoes what Claire was saying, and I think that that's a very, re fairly reasonable position to take. So I'll ask you the same question I asked Claire. Do you feel comfortable telling us where you think your current political, uh, you know, context is in terms of that balance? Do you feel like we've got the right balance of giving people what they need to survive, but allowing people the freedom to earn what they want? Can you elaborate a little bit more? Well, yeah, I mean, essentially you were saying you agree there should be a baseline support to make sure everybody, you know, stays alive, but you you want people to be free to earn their, earn what they want, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if we go back to the homeless situation again, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but you have like homeless shelters uh, that uh, and, I, and I don't know, and, and I, this, is, this is because I don't know exactly how it works, but uh, so do you know if like homeless shelters require people that live in them to be actively looking for jobs? Or something well, I mean, like that? Because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And I think, you know, we could talk about homelessness specifically, but I think there are a lot of other factors involved in like the particular, well, particularly the homelessness situation that make that pretty specific. So let's, let's instead thinking about what we may call like the working poor, okay? So let's imagine like there's a whole swath of our society that, that have jobs, minimum wage jobs, and you know, they're, ma they're making it by, but you know, they, they don't have enough necessarily to thrive, right? Like maybe they're, they're one medical bill away from, you know, um, bankruptcy or things like that. Do you feel like our country has the right balance of like supporting the working poor to keep them alive while still allowing for enough freedom for them to, you know, 
pull themselves up by their bootstraps to acquire what it is, the dreams that they want. Lee, what do you want, what do you want to say? Um, I was going to say, I don't think there's that sort of balance. I think we put more of an emphasis on individual liberty because there's a lot of people who know what they want, but are just too lazy to do it. And they just expect it to be handed it to handed to them. But when it comes to like, like the working, the working class and people who aren't able, who like, like you said, are like one hospital bill away from bankruptcy. What I see now in like today's society, I feel like we don't care about those people. Like the government doesn't care about those people as much because like I've, I've heard so many different people say like, I don't want my taxpayer dollars paying for somebody who's broke or who doesn't want to work. It's not that they don't want to work. It's that some people are genuinely put at a disadvantage from birth because of, like, a uh, disability or just, like, how they look or whatever. So I definitely don't think there's a balance. So, okay, so what I hear you saying, Lee, is you don't think the balance is correct. You think, you know, you would be okay uh, seeing, for example, just broadly speaking, higher tax rates on middle and high income earners in order to subsidize healthcare or education or something for those that are on the lower income distribution. Okay, all right. Even though that might mean some reduction in freedom or liberty, right? Like as, as a middle, tax, middle class taxpayer, like every dollar you take away from me is a dollar that I don't have to spend how I want, right? So, but that's what, I mean, I'm not saying I disagree with you, Lee. Um, you're, you're just saying you, you prefer that sacrifice. You, you think that sacrifice is, is good to be made. Okay, awesome. There was a lot of head shaking, by the way, Lee, while you were talking. I don't know if you can see that. There are a lot of, a lot of other folks that seem to agree with you. Sophie, your thoughts? Well, I think Lee's like totally right. And I think that's something that people don't acknowledge enough that it's not that everyone is given the same starting point. And like, I do yeah. think people forget that when they're talking about like taxation and that type of thing. I do think there should be limitations. like. I do think some of, like, if I don't, it's hard because you don't, you want to be on both sides of it, right? Like, I don't want to say someone who makes more money should be punished because they were successful, but I also don't think someone who's poor because of disadvantages should be hooked by that. So I think there's like, I kind of also agree with John, like there should be a baseline, but I also don't think total equality is possible in like government or economics with like, just with free will and human opinions, but also like the government's been part of the problem. Like the government is what created these divisions, these divides, because the government put down people and now it's had these lasting consequences. So the government all along was part of the problem. So I don't know if like to this question, it would depend on maybe how far back taking the government away goes or stuff like that, because the government has created this issue and now at some point it is up to them to fix it, but also there's like an ineffective issue because the government tries to help the poor, but some, it never seems to be as effective as they hope it would be. So it kind of leads to this question of how can we help the most people with all the money that we are taking from Americans already? Because people do need help in our country, even if people want to like, even though the poor are richer than some people in really poor countries, in our country, they're still at a disadvantage because of our capitalist economy, putting, like, hurting them when they have lower wages. So, so, so maybe Rousseau was right. Maybe, maybe, like, the more layers we put into our society, the worse it is. Maybe Adam Smith was right. I mean, Sophie's just said the government hasn't done a good job of erasing these, inequal these inequalities. Maybe, maybe we should, in, in fact, get the government out of this business and let individuals just help each other through charities and religious organizations and just good old-fashioned neighborly love. Charlotte, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, I just wanted to add something on to the previous point that was... Uh, Something we don't consider a lot of time is usually people are homeless or poor because of things outside of their control. Like there's economic factors of student loans are a lot. Uh, things cost a lot of money and wages are low, but there's also other things that could keep people from getting a job, workplace discrimination, uh, being uneligible to be hired because you're LGBT or because you're a minority. 
And there's also the kind of, the part no one ever really talks about is that the disabled are often homeless or the people with mental illnesses like PTSD or bipolar disorder. They often are unable to get jobs because of just the hand they've been dealt kind of thing. That They're not lazy, they're just living. Or people that are dealing with substance abuse issues. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, before we go any further, I just want to take a moment. I want to thank John. Uh, personally, I want to thank Charlotte and Claire and Dylan and Lee. Uh, Lee, yes, Lee. And who else? Who else today was online and shared with us? I don't want to miss anybody. But Claire, Claire if I miss anybody, yeah. Claire, did I say Claire? Claire, yeah. thank you. Um, to my, to my in-person folks, Sophie and Ritesh and Elias and Garen, for those of you that were listening, maybe you didn't say anything, but you were just listening and engaged, I really appreciate you. We're going to get interrupted in just a minute by announcements about bus changes, I have a feeling. So I just want our online folks, uh, the quick homework assignment for you to do is there's a political quiz for you to take. Now, it's going to be anonymous. It's anonymous, so I'm not going to know who said what. And I, we're going to collect some data about the class. Okay, so if you could do that for me, that'd be great. Online folks, I love you. I'll see you. See you next week. Amazing. You're amazing.